Lesson 9.1 is titled Distance, Midpoint, and Perpendicular Bisectors. We're going to learn some new formulas today and utilize ordered pair coordinates on a graph to determine the answers. The first formula is titled Distance Formula, and it simply represents the distance or length between two points on a coordinate system. You'll notice if you have an x1, y1 coordinate and an x2, y2 coordinate, the distance formula is the square root Oops, I didn't want to do that. Hang on. It's the square root of the difference in x's squared plus the difference in y squared. It's kind of like Pythagorean theorem if you remember that from geometry. a squared plus b squared equals c squared. c was always the length of that hypotenuse, which would be a diagonal on a coordinate system. Whenever you have a square root, you always want to simplify, if possible, that square root solution. This means we're going to use our rules from Lesson 4.5 back in our last chapter. So we're just going to say like in Lesson 4.5. Not every square root answer will simpli simplify, but we'll keep our answers in exact form. First question, find the distance between negative 3, 5 and 4, negative 1. What you'll want to do is identify the coordinates. We have an x1 and a y1 x2 and y2. Once you know those two values, you simply plug them into that formula up above. Distance equals, it's a really big square root answer, so we're going to start with a really big square root. Take x2 minus x1, that would be 4 minus negative 3, and we're going to square that answer. We'll add to that y2 minus y1, which is negative 1 minus 5. Again, like everything we do, attention to detail is going to matter. Watch your parentheses and watch when you have two negatives in a row. From here, now it's just a matter of simplifying. 4 minus negative 3, we have a double negative, which is going to make that change to positive. And that will become 7 squared. Plus, when we combine the negative 1 minus 5, we're actually going to get negative 6 squared. Hopefully you recognize the same thing that we did back in chapter 4. When you square a negative or a positive, you're always going to get a positive answer. 7 squared is positive 49. Negative 6 squared is positive 36. And when you add those two numbers together to combine like terms, we get the square root of 85. Once you combine like terms, try to simplify the square root. This is known as an exact answer in this form. If you plug it into your calculator, you get a decimal approximation. Keep your answers exact unless asked for a decimal. If we have the square root of 85, nothing goes into 85, that's a perfect square. Therefore, that is the exact simplified answer. Let's see now how we can utilize the distance formula to answer a different kind of question. Plot A, B, and C. A is at 4, 6, B is at 7, 3, and C is at 2, 1. Go ahead and plot those three coordinates over on the right and connect them to create a triangle. Then we will classify the triangle as scalene, isosceles, or equilateral. Looking at the triangle at the right, scalene would mean all three sides have different lengths. Isosceles means two of the three sides have equal length, Equilateral means all three sides have equal length. Therefore, to classify the triangle, we will apply the distance formula. Let's first find the length of segment AB. That means we'll have x1, y1, and I'll label that for A. B will be our x2, y2. If we apply distance formula here, we're going to have to write kind of small. Then I guess you can use your space on the left-hand side if you need to. We're not going to put anything in that column on this page. So distance formula for AB. If we take x2 minus x1 plus y2 minus y1, now we need to simplify. 7 minus 4 is 3. 3 minus 6 is negative 3. Get that negative in there. 
But remember, when we square a number, we're always going to get a positive result. 3 squared is 9, and another 3 squared is 9. 9 plus 9 is 18. Trying to simplify, 18 breaks down into 9 times 2. And 9 is that perfect square. So these are the rules that we kind of applied in chapter 4 last time. The square root of 9 is 3, so that goes to the outside. The 2 is kind of stuck on the inside. There's the length of AB. What I'd like you to do is pause the video and find the length of AC. You try that one next, and we'll see if we at least have a scaling triangle from there. So rewrite, your. we have x1, y1 for a, let's go ahead and identify c as x2, y2. And we'll get rid of the x2, y2 for b and see what happens. All right, please try distance formula. When you're ready to proceed, press play. Did you get the square root of 29? If so, that would be the exact square root answer and simplified. Nothing goes into 29, that's a perfect square. So far, that would indicate that we have a scaling triangle. These two sides aren't the same. The last segment we need to look for is the length of BC. What I'm going to do here, let's see what I have. I already have C as X2, Y2. I'm going to designate B as X1, Y1. And I'll get rid of the A, X1, Y1, so it doesn't throw us off. All right, one last round of distance formula. So you can see we won't do too many of these. There's a lot of distance formula practice. All right, for that last round, you should get BC equals the square root of 29. And again, like AC, that is the simplified form. Since two of the three sides are the same, so AC and BC are the same, we would actually classify this triangle as isosceles. I hope that you remember that from geometry last year. Two of the three sides are the same, therefore it's isosceles. All right, now let's try working backwards. It says use the given distance d between the two points to find the value of x. We have x comma 7 and negative 4 comma 1, with the distance between them being 6 times the square root of 2. If we think about our process, we always identify the coordinates for our ordered pairs. Let's identify x1, y1 for that first set, and x2, y2 for the second set. If we apply the definition for distance formula, the formula is x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared. Substituting in all the values we know, Distance is 6 times the square root of 2. That goes on the left side. On the right-hand side, we have a big square root. x2 minus x1 would be negative 4 minus x squared. The nice thing about this is we're actually going to leave that parenthesis. We're not going to do anything with it for a while. And then plus parenthesis y2 minus y1, 1 minus 7 squared. Really, the only thing at this point we can simplify is we can take that 1 minus 7 and clean it up a little bit. We'll keep the 6 square root 2. We'll keep the big square root for now. Negative 4 minus x we're not going to do anything with, but 1 minus 7 is negative 6. Still, you can go one step further. If you square negative 6, we would get positive 36. Okay, so we're going to leave the parenthesis with x in it, but we simplified the other one. Our next step then would be to start kind of moving things over, getting rid of kind of the big things that are happening to x right now. The biggest thing that's happening to x on that right hand side is the square root over everything. What we'll do to get rid of that is that actually square each side. It's kind of the reverse of what we did when we solved back in chapter 4. If we square the left-hand side, that means we have to write this out twice. So 6 square root 2 times itself. On the right, if we square the entire square root, the whole thing just cancels out. And we still have that negative 4 minus x in parentheses, there's our detail, plus 36. But now there isn't a square root on the right-hand side. 
On the left, we multiply outside parts with outside parts. 6 times 6 is 36. And then inside parts with inside parts. The square root of 2 times the square root of 2 is the square root of 4. On the right, we're not doing anything. Leave it alone. On the left, the square root of 4 is 2. So then 36 times 2 would give us 72 on that left-hand side. Negative 4 minus x squared plus 36. Whew, okay, so we simplified the left. Now let's move things over. We still want to get x by itself, so let's isolate that quadratic term. Hopefully that sounds familiar. We just did that in chapter 4. To isolate that squared parenthesis, we're actually going to subtract 36 from each side. And I am running out of space, so I'm going to bring that up and over. We'll have plenty of room to finish over here on the right. 72 minus 36 gives us 36. On the right, we'll have negative 4 minus x squared. Once you have a squared on the ice, or once you have a squared term isolated, what we did back in chapter 4 was we then took the square root of each side. I know, it seems like we already just got rid of the square root, and now we're taking a square root. If you recall, on the left-hand side where that square root is, we have to put a plus or minus out in front. And the square root of 36 is a perfect square. It equals 6. On the right, just like it did before, the square root and the squared cancel out, giving us just negative 4 minus x. Still need to get x by itself, therefore we have to add 4 to each side from chapter 4 to combine everything on that left. Remember the 4 has to go out in front. Plus or minus 6 equals negative x. Last but not least, divide both sides by negative 1 because why wouldn't we? If you have 4 plus or minus 6 divided by negative 1 equals x, you can split that up into 4 plus 6 over negative 1 that's hard to see, sorry. 4 minus 6 over negative 1. I'm going to fix that so it's easier to see everybody. Sorry about that. Let's clean that one up a little. 4 plus 6, there we go, over negative 1. So 4 plus 6 over negative 1 would be 10 over negative 1 or negative 10. That's one option for x. 4 minus 6 is negative 2, but divided by negative 1 would be positive 2. What this means is on your coordinate system, that x for the first coordinate could be at negative 10 or positive 2, and you would have the distance of 6 square root 2 between those two points. Flip it over, we're going to talk about midpoint, and midpoint is a much easier formula to work with. All right, midpoint formula. You'll notice there's no square root, but the trade-off in midpoint formula, given two coordinates on a graph, is that you take their average to find the middle. You're going to add the x-coordinates and divide by 2. Then you add the y-coordinates and divide by 2. And that's it. So midpoint formula will likely go a little bit faster than the distance formula does. And remember to write your answer as an ordered pair. Oh, I did that last time. I don't want it in the highlighter mode. Here we go. Your answer should be an ordered pair. There we go. And the nice thing is about this is you'll either have a whole number or integer, or you'll have a fraction with two in the denominator. So even the fractions shouldn't be too bad to deal with. It says find the midpoint of the line segment joining negative 5, 1 and negative 1, 6. Please plot those two points on the graph on the right and connect them. All right, once you connect that line segment to find the middle of that line segment, we will apply the midpoint formula. If we have x1, y1, get that 1 in there, x2, y2, you literally just add the x's together, divide by 2, add the y's. So midpoint formula. It's kind of a big ordered pair formula. x1 plus x2, negative 5 plus negative 1, all over 2. y1 plus y2, 1 plus 6 over 2. And then we simplify. Negative 5 plus negative 1 would be negative 6 over 2. 1 plus 6 is 7 over 2. If you can reduce the fraction, please do so. Always simplify if possible. 
Negative 6 over 2 would be negative 3. 7 over 2 doesn't simplify, so you can leave it as an improper fraction or write it as a mixed number, 3 and a half. Over on our graph, if we count negative 3 and up 3 and a half, notice you're right here. And that would be the midpoint of that line segment. And that's how you do for this formula. However, like distance formula, we can work backwards. It says find the coordinates of point A if the midpoint is th negative 3, 2, and B is at 5, negative 6. So if our midpoint is here, then B is the only value we can identify. Let's call that x1, y1. And if the midpoint formula is the sum of the x's divided by 2 and the sum of the y's divided by 2, we'll have x1 plus x2 over 2, y1 plus y2 over 2. To work backwards, we're actually going to plug in negative 3, 2 on that left-hand side. Negative 3, 2. Negative 3 represents the x value, and positive 2 represents the y value. If we take x1 plus x2, that would be 5 plus x2, all over 2, comma. y1 would be negative 6 plus y2 over 2. In order to solve for x2 and y2, which would be the answer for point A, we have to actually group that formula to the midpoint solution. So here's what I mean by that. If we take x or 5 plus x2 over 2, that should be equal to negative 3 when we're done. Negative 3 equals 5 plus x2 over 2. To get x2 by itself, if we simply multiply 2 on each side, that will get rid of the fraction. It's pretty easy to do that. So negative 6 equals 5 plus x2. Then what you'd want to do is move the 5 over. We're kind of doing some basic algebra right now. And we would get x2 equals negative 11. Then we need to do the same thing with the y values, but first I'm going to give myself a little more room. And we need a new color. If the formula for the y coordinate is negative 6 plus y2 over 2, that has to have an output of positive 2. That means 2 has to equal negative 6 plus y2 over 2. Can you apply the same rules we just did with x2 and get y2 by itself? Please try that and plus press play when you're done. So working backwards, there's a little bit more work involved, but it's just kind of some basic algebra again. You should get your y2 coordinate to be positive 10. What this means is that point A has to be at the coordinates negative 11, 10, for the midpoint to be negative 3, positive 2. And I think that's enough for this first part of lesson 9.1.